All right, awesome. Well, hello and welcome everyone to our phenomenal Cosmic Exploration Speaker Series. And it's going to be given from the magnificent Dr. Melissa Trainer. And so we are so excited. Hey, he's excited to join us tonight. I am going to find our director of the LPI because because maybe she is on the attending side. I do not see her. Let's see. Maybe this is her. Dr. Gaddis. Have you joined us tonight? And that is quite all right. All right, so I will be introducing our speaker. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Cosmic Exploration Speaker Series. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Melissa Trainer of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Dr. Trainer's educational background includes a BA 2000 Chemistry Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and then her also she received her PhD in 2006 in chemistry from the University of Colorado Boulder. Dr. Trainer has been at Goddard since 2009 and her research interests there include the composition of planetary atmospheres, particularly the production of organic molecules and aerosol. Melissa is the deputy principal investigator of the Dragonfly mission to Saturn's moon Titan, part of NASA's planetary science new Frontiers program. She is also the lead of the Dragonfly mass spectrometer, an instrument supporting the Dragonfly investigation of Titan surface composition and characterization of potential chemistry. Melissa has been involved with several NASA's missions, including serving on the science team of the sample analysis of Mars experiment on the Mars Science Laboratory Missions Curiosity Rover, where she studies the composition of the Mars atmosphere. She is also a co-investor on the discovery candidate of Da Vinci, Da Vinci Plus mission, which is completed phase A studies most recently in 2021. The fascinating Dragonfly mission to Saturn's large Titan is the topic of Melissa's talk tonight. Melissa, thank you so much for agreeing to present for us. Take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Sherelle. I'm so happy to be here tonight. And thank you to everybody who is calling in, um, dialing in from wherever you're dialing in from. Uh, as you can see, I'm presenting from my house. It's kind of <laughs> fun that we can all be here together um, in this way. Um, and let's see. Are we good with my slides? They're beautiful. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Tonight, I'm going to talk about the Dragonfly mission. And first, just explain what is so interesting about the destination for this mission, which is Saturn's moon Titan, which you can see in this image here. And we've marked out with this arrow where on, on Titan, approximately Dragonfly, uh, will be landing to do its surface investigation. Of course, I have to mention that every mission involves really hundreds of people to make it happen. And I would like to acknowledge this is just a portion of the Dragonfly team. This is a photo that was taken shortly after we were selected um, by NASA. Uh, a more recent photo, which will probably look more familiar to many of you, is taken at a science team meeting that we had uh, last November. So we're all finding new ways to uh, work together and, and do our jobs um, from home. And we've actually had a, a, a Great past year, uh, despite some of the challenges that have been presented with um, our, our work at home environment. So first, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, Titan. Titan is the largest moon of Saturn. You can see in this image here, it's actually it's quite a bit larger than uh, the other moons of Saturn. And another moon that sometimes gets a lot of attention, you kind of see over here, is Enceladus. Um, Enceladus is uh, a moon, it has these beautiful photos showing jets coming out of its, its south pole, jets of, of water ice. And so that's another one that we talk about a lot, but of course all of these moons are, are very uh, exciting and, and cool places. Um, here is Titan among 
all of the satellites in our solar system. And these are all shown sort of in size order. And you can see here Titan is the second largest moon in the solar system. But there's something about it in this image that really makes it stand out. You don't see craters, um, you don't see ice cracks, and you don't see any surface features at all here in, in this visible image. You see what just looks like kind of a hazy orange ball. And that's because Titan actually has an atmosphere, unlike uh, these other moons. And that atmosphere is full of this hazy material. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, just to give you um, some information about what some of these other moons are, so you can see most of the other uh, large moons in this image are actually moons of Jupiter. This shows Titan compared to some of the terrestrial planets, uh, especially ones that uh, you may be more familiar with, such as, of course, Earth um, or perhaps Venus and Mars. Here, again, it's sort of placed in its um, order based on size, but if we were to place it in order of its atmospheric pressure or how much atmosphere it has, it would actually go in between Venus and Earth because it has higher surface pressure and a denser atmosphere than Earth does. So here's our fact sheet. So we can talk a little bit about um, some, some fun things about Titan. So its diameter, it's about 5,000 kilometers or, or 3,000 miles. And you saw how it compared, for example, to the Earth or the moon. Its surface gravity is 0.14 G. Um, and that is 14% uh, of the gravity at Earth's surface. So about one seventh of the gravity uh, that we have at Earth. So that's a really important feature of Titan that actually plays into the Dragonfly mission. Uh, the other thing is its surface pressure, I mentioned it's denser than Earth. It's actually 1.5 times the pressure of the Earth's surface is what you would feel at the pressure of Titan's surface. But something really important about Titan is it's really cold there. Um, in Fahrenheit, the surface temperature is minus 290 Fahrenheit. Um, it's hard almost to imagine how cold that is, uh, but if you have experienced um, you know, zero Fahrenheit, <laughs> if you've even stuck, you know, stuck your hand in the freezer or um, something like that, you can imagine just how much colder it is on the surface of Titan. And that's because it's a lot further from the sun than Earth, right? So it's, it's, it's just generally colder. What's cool about Titan is that because it's cold and because it exists, you know, out in the outer solar system, it's it's made up of some different stuff than what we're than what our Earth is made up of. This is a cross section of what we think the interior of Titan looks like, and so of course it has it has a core um, with a sort of a rock rocky core, but then there's layers of um, water ice, and there's also an ocean, sort of a deep interior ocean uh, that's liquid water. And it's sort of analogous to how we have the, the liquid uh, rock layer, like a mantle inside of the earth, except in this case, it's uh, liquid water. And then there's another layer of water ice above that. And that sort of forms almost like the, the crust or the surface of Titan. And then on the, um, the actual surface, you can have some areas of exposed water ice um, and it's so cold there, Titan, that water ice there is as hard as rock is on Earth. And then you can also have, it turns out, this organic material everywhere. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that, too. So one question, why does Titan look so hazy? And the answer is, is actually really fascinating. It is um, due to this complex organic chemistry that takes place in Titan's atmosphere. This cartoon on the right sort of gives an overview of, of how we think that happens. So we get uh, a chemistry, photochemistry in the upper atmosphere. That means that's sort of chemistry that starts with sunlight coming in. The energy from sunlight coming in breaks apart the main components of Titan's atmosphere. Titan is mostly, the atmosphere of Titan is mostly nitrogen, which is a lot like, that's just like the Earth's atmosphere. Earth's atmosphere is uh, about 80% nitrogen. On Titan, it's about 95% nitrogen. Uh, but the next most abundant component on Titan is methane. You may be from, more familiar with methane as, uh, for example, natural gas, something on Earth that, that we can burn as a fuel. Um, and on Titan, it's a, several percent of the atmosphere is composed of methane. 
And then the sunlight comes in and it can break apart the nitrogen and the methane that's in the atmosphere. And then those, those pieces of those molecules can then recombine to form different and larger kinds of molecules. Um, and then they get bigger and bigger and bigger and grow until they actually condense into a, a solid particle that then is in the atmosphere sort of as a haze. It's not that dissimilar, for example, to the type of smog that you might find in an urban environment in, in how it sort of forms and then condenses out and then and stays suspended in the atmosphere. So this happens on Titan. It makes these particles that have uh, sort of a complex organic chemistry. And then ultimately those will deposit onto the surface. And so you can end up with organic material on the surface as well. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what, what that can mean for this idea of Titan as a destination to think about things like habitability or um, prebiotic chemistry, because we think that this type of chemistry that's taking place on Titan could be relevant for the types of chemical processes that maybe happened on Earth a really long time ago, like billions of years ago. But let's talk a little bit more about um, some, some cool things about Titan. Uh, I loved talking about years and seasons on Titan because they're just so much bigger and so much longer than what we're used to on Earth. But again, in some ways, you know, kind of similar. Um, Titan has a tilt. It follows Saturn's uh, tilt of about 26 degrees. It's not that different than Earth's tilt, which uh, creates our seasons. And so you do get seasons on Titan. They're just really long. So uh, Saturn and Titan's year, as you can see here, is about 30 Earth years. The Titan day is the amount of time it takes it to orbit Saturn. And that is 16 Earth days. Um, the right, we have sort of a calendar of the different seasons uh, for Titan. And the arrow indicates where we are right now, which is in between the Northern summer solstice and the Northern, um, well, it would be the, the equinox, we would consider the Northern fall equinox. So it's, so it's summer on Titan right now. And when we're looking to go to Titan with the Dragonfly mission, it will be um, in between the northern winter solstice and equinox, it will be northern winter on Titan at that time. This is a plot that shows kind of that idea of how long it takes Titan and Saturn to go around the sun and create a year and how that has timed out with our exploration of Titan and, and what we've learned about it. So if you follow this plot from over here on the red going again past the winter solstice, and it, it goes kind of counterclockwise around this circle. The Cassini and Huygens mission arrived in uh, 2004, and the Huygens probe was actually a spacecraft that went into the atmosphere of Titan in early 2005. And so that happened sort of at that period of northern winter. And then Cassini kept exploring all the way through the spring equinox, and then up until the northern summer solstice. And so it was there for 13 years and still only explored less than half of a Saturn year and just saw um, some of those seasons and just gives you an idea of how long it takes for Saturn to go around the sun. Um, also Pioneer and Voyager flybys happened um, kind of uh, you know around sort of this uh, springtime. Equinox. So most of our exploration of Titan has all been on that that part of uh, the Saturn year. This is an image of the Cassini Huygens spacecraft um, that, as we mentioned, uh, went to Titan. On the left, you can see the picture of the Cassini spacecraft. There's no people in here for scale, but if you look really closely on the bottom left, you see a desk and a desk chair. And that kind of gives you an idea of just how big uh, the spacecraft is. On the right is the Huygens probe. And so this probe, it's shown tucked into its aeroshell. And the probe went through the atmosphere of Titan and uh, landed actually on the Titan surface and survived for about 70 minutes. And sent data back and pictures from that descent down and, and from its time sitting on the surface. And in this case, you can see the people that are right next to it to give, give you an idea of the scale of that lander. And so, um, we're going to talk about this because a, a lot of what we have learned about Titan has come from this particular mission. Um, as we mentioned, the Cassini mission was in the Saturn system for 13 years. And during that time, it had over 100 close flybys of Titan. This plot on the right just gives you an idea of all of the different orbits 
that that Cassini orbiter took around Saturn. And this red circle here is Titan's orbit. And you can kind of uh, see how it flew by uh, many, 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 many times. One of the other places it flew by as well that we investigated was that other moon that I mentioned earlier of Enceladus. And that is how we discovered these jets coming out of the Enceladus South Pole. So what have we learned about Titan from these missions as well as from any um, either ground-based telescopes or some other missions? Um, well, one thing that we have learned when you can look through that, that very orangey haze that's formed from those haze particles, we've learned that the surface is actually um, really fascinating and very diverse. It's made up of lots of diverse environments. It's just, it's not just one thing. This is um, an image that's composed of images that have been taken at, at different wavelengths, sort of near infrared and infrared wavelengths, and then put together in a composite. And the different coloration shows areas where you have different compositions. Um, and we don't know exactly what the composition of the materials is in, in every place. There are some places you can tell there's maybe some exposed water ice from that water ice crust or, or other places where we think it has more of an organic component from the material falling down from the sky. But we don't know the exact composition, but by looking at this image, you can see that because you see lots of different colors everywhere and you see lots of different structures everywhere, that should give you the idea that there's lots of different places all over the place, right? And so some place where it's a very dark purple color is gonna be different than a place where you see a lot of orange. There's some really amazing features too that we have discovered on the Titan surface that really, even though it sounds like it's this crazy different place and this totally different temperature, but it really evokes this idea of like, these places look familiar. They kind of remind us of the kinds of features and processes that we have on earth. Here's one of my favorites. Uh, these equatorial um, dune fields. If you look at this image, you can see these wavy lines, these dunes that are formed. And it's thought that they are formed kind of starting with that organic material that comes down from the sky, eventually forms these slightly larger particles that are more like, um, you know, you think of sand that we have on the earth and then uh, blown around and, and form these dune structures. And we find them kind of flowing along the equator in certain areas. And um, it tells us also something about the wind patterns. We definitely see impact craters when we are able to look at the surface, maybe not as many as some of those other moons that are pockmarked with lots of those, but on Titan, we have a few things that make it a little bit harder to see some of the impact craters. One is of course the dense atmosphere slows down and, and uh, can sort of break up some of the smaller impacts. So you have to have a much larger impact uh, to get all the way down and, and have a big crater on the surface. And the other thing is weathering. Actually, I've already touched on the idea of the thicker atmosphere. And I've touched on the idea of the wind blowing sand around. And so you start to get this idea that, that there's weathering on Titan. That's a lot like the kind of weathering that we get on Earth. And that can actually lead to um, uh, changing of the impact craters over time, which might soften the, you know, the crater rims or fill them in and, and maybe make it a little bit harder to see some of these craters from, from where we are on the flyby. We see evidence of um, sort of tectonic behavior where parts of the, the ice crust or the, the, the surface of Titan um, can make mountain ridges, uh, for example. There's also this potential for what we call cryovolcanism. So think of uh, volcanoes and volcanism and eruptions on Earth, but on Titan, as I mentioned, the interior liquid layer that could be coming up and erupting uh, would be liquid water or potentially liquid water and ammonium mixtures. And so it's thought that it's possible if you could get communication sort of uh, from that liquid coming up through the ice crust and then coming out onto the surface and get these cryo lava flows. And then over time, it would take a while for them uh, to freeze over. So you could have periods of time where that, that cryolava liquid water uh, stayed as a liquid water on the surface until it was frozen. We don't have any definitive evidence that there is um, for sure cryovolcanic flows on Titan. Here are um, sort of some uh, radar and near IR images of features that potentially could be explained with, with um, some kind of uh, eruption and flow out on the surface. 
We also see evidence of river channels. And uh, these river channels would be the result of rain. So methane, which I mentioned, is a few percent in Titan's atmosphere, is actually not that far from its um, condensation point to make liquid methane. Um, and it's a lot like the water cycle is on Earth, the methane cycle on Titan, because you can get clouds and you can get rain and you can get liquid methane flowing on the surface and carving out things like these river channels. And we have found uh, at the North Pole, especially a whole bunch of these lakes and seas that are filled with liquid methane and liquid ethane. So again, it's so cold there that something that would easily be a gas in our atmosphere on Earth, it can, can condense out and make a liquid and make a whole sea. If you look at this image here, um, the sea that the arrow is sort of coming out of in this picture, this is called Ligia Mare, and that's about the size of Lake Superior um, in uh, America, in the Great Lakes of America. And so that gives you an idea about the size of this. And this is another really cool thing about Titan. Titan is the only other place in the solar system where there's open surface liquid that you could go sailing on. So you've got the oceans, liquid water oceans on Earth, and on Titan, you have these uh, seas that are made from liquid hydrocarbons. Here are some images also, again, kind of bringing that idea of this, this methane cycle that's like Earth's water cycle. We see evidence of clouds, we see weather patterns. Uh, there was even an observation where you could see where a rainstorm had passed through on the surface of Titan. It had rained and, and the surface got wet and then it sort of dried up again, just like on Earth with the pavement, you know, it might get dark after it rains and then once it dries, it gets lighter. So Titan is a very exotic place in that the way it's structured and the materials that might make up its atmosphere and its surface are a little different than what we think of for Earth. But in some ways, it's very similar. There's a lot of similar processes and a lot of similar aspects that we can relate to. Um, here I want to point out where Huygens, that probe that fell through the atmosphere, landed. Here's an image uh, from the, the plane where Huygens landed, and it's put side by side with an image from the moon when the astronauts landed. Just to give you an idea of scale, this is an astronaut footprint, and here are some of the cobblestones that Huygens saw from the surface. And here again, the thinking is that these might be made out of uh, possibly water ice coated in organic material, um, but we don't, we don't know exactly what that surface composition is for sure. And so when we put all this together, we have these processes that are very interesting and somewhat similar to Earth. And we have all, but we have all these exotic materials. What we realize is that it may seem very different than what we think of as like an Earth-like environment, but Titan really has all of the key ingredients that are necessary for life as we know it, right? Um, meaning life kind of like Earth life. So let's walk through it with this cartoon of Titan. So one thing I, life needs definitely is energy. And at Titan, again, we have that energy coming in from sunlight. We have the chemistry that gets kicked off with that sunlight, breaking apart molecules. And then what that ends up doing is turning that into a chemical energy that can then get transported uh, down to the surface. We have abundant organic material. Um, we, I think it was mentioned that I work on the science team for the Curiosity rover on Mars. And on that mission, we're, we're driving over around Mars and we're looking at all of these um, sort of inorganic rock minerals and we're searching for any organic molecules that might be trapped inside them. Whereas on Titan, we're just like, organics are everywhere. There's lots of organic material. And organic material, you know, we're so interested in that for life because it's the stuff that you and I are all made out of or the stuff that we eat basically. So things made out of car carbon and hydrogen and um, nitrogen based molecules are, are really important for biochemistry as we know it. And Titan is, we know is just full of that kind of material. The question is whether or not it's, it's really uh, similar to the types of molecules that are relevant for earth life. Um, so we have it everywhere in form of the haze. And as I said, it falls down to the surface and then we have liquids. So we do have liquid water. I mentioned the deep ocean, but that's that's you know somewhat far down. But I also talked about impacts 
And I talked about that possible cryovolcanism. And especially in terms of impacts, if you have a large impactor that comes in and makes a big crater, like the kind that we can see on Titan, it means that at some point in that impact, so much energy was put in the system that it melted the ice crust. And you had some liquid water in that area, and it would have persisted for a reasonably long time, kind of scaled with how big the impact is because that's how much energy was put in it. And it takes it a while, even as cold as Titan it is, it can take it a while to freeze over. It could be something like hundreds of thousands to maybe even 10,000 years, depending on the impact. And so now you've got uh, this liquid water sitting on the surface. We know the liquid water is very important for biochemistry as we know it. And you have all these organics raining down and all this organic material everywhere. And suddenly what you have is a very temporarily potentially um, habitable and, and environment that's very interesting for prebiotic chemistry. And so we're very curious what could happen in those environments um, in Titan's past. And then of course, there's the second liquid, which we talked about, which is liquid methane um, that is on the surface. And, and that sort of makes our imaginations go wild in terms of, well, is it possible that there could be some other kind of interesting um, chemistry or, or biochemistry that could happen in uh, a liquid ethane or methane type solvent? Um, so sort of to sum it up, what we have at Titan is we have this whole planetary body. We know we have this fascinating chemistry taking place. Um, there are times in its past where you definitely could have gotten the types of reactions that could be important for Prebiotic chemistry, meaning making the molecules that are important for our life, such as amino acids or, or nucleobases, things that are really important for our biochemistry. And it could be happening on this global scale, and it could be happening on a planet that, as far as we know, you know, isn't covered in life, right? Everywhere we go on Earth to try to learn about chemistry that might have been important in Earth's past, it's hard to tease it out because life is everywhere, right? Biology has imprinted all over all of those signals on Earth. But on Titan, we have this opportunity to visit these locations and find out what could have happened in these different environments. And especially in the impact craters, um, as they refroze, any evidence of any cool chemistry that was taking place in there would, would now kind of just be frozen, frozen in time. And so we get a chance to go there and kind of measure the results from any of those experiments that were taking place. Um, so that sort of brings us to, to the idea of the Dragonfly mission then, right, is to really understand what makes a planet or a moon you know habitable does it have to look just like earth or can there be some different kinds of systems and processes that are operating but maybe um, create environments that are still conducive even if it's transient uh, to some kind of um, uh, life or biochemistry being able to take place and also to think about what chemical processes can lead to the development of life if you have an abiotic environment an environment where chemistry is, is taking place that maybe does or doesn't kind of take you all the way to like, how far can you get just with, with chemistry? And of course, the big question that so many of us, um, you know, ask or and want to answer is, is has life developed elsewhere in our solar system? You know, and, and these um, outer solar system satellites, these ocean worlds, uh, like Titan or Enceladus or Europa, Jupiter, these are these are places that we need to visit and, and we need to understand if it's possible that life is, is at any of these locations in the solar system. Time check. Okay, so Cassini, uh, all the discovery by Cassini sort of told, told us where we should look. So it told us there are lots of diverse surface materials, there's all these diverse environments, and we know there's a lot of Earth-like geology um, there, but the trick is, well, if you had to pick one place, how would you know where to to go where is the best place to go look to really understand the prebiotic chemistry cycle what you want to do is not have to pick one place you want to be able to go to lots of different places and so mobility is is really important for that now on mars um we've been able to do that very successfully and if, this is curiosity but of course most recently with perseverance as well and what we do is we rove right we drive around um but titan has some advantages that we want to take it we want to take advantage of when we're exploring. I mentioned the very dense atmosphere, which gives you a lot of air that you can push against. It's, it's very good for um, either lighter than air flight, like balloons, or even heavier than air, like airplanes and helicopters. Um, and also I mentioned the low gravity. Titan's low gravity means that it's easier to lift yourself off the surface. So with the dense atmosphere and the low gravity, you don't need as much power as you do on Earth even to either flap wings or, for example, spin a rotor on something like a helicopter. 
um, I really like this cartoon because it kind of uh, shows, um, you know, it's a lot easier. In fact, it's easier in some ways to fly on Titan than it is on Earth because of the low gravity. But of course, it's much harder to do on Mars, but we know that we have successfully had a helicopter fly on Mars, which is fantastic. Um, so with all of that together, it made much more sense instead of trying to slowly drive around on, on Titan where we don't know the surface, we don't have great high resolution images, we're gonna fly instead. And that gives us the ability sort of to hop around, um, but to cover really far distances, going tens to hundreds of kilometers apart, visit all of these different surface locations and ask these questions about prebiotic chemistry and composition in, in all of those different environments that we were talking about, or at least many, many of them. Um, briefly to just talk about the, what does the Dragonfly mission phase kind of look like. So we're going to launch in 2027 and we have a cruise phase going, you know, after launch, we fly, we have to go from Earth all the way out to the Saturn system and that's going to take uh, years. <laughs> and while we do that, Dragonfly is tucked up in that cruise stage. And then when we get to Titan, it takes a few hours. Um, the this sort of entry shell comes in, the parachute comes out, we have this whole EDL assembly and the rotorcraft lander is tucked inside and it eventually will get released from that back shell and, and just start flying itself and land itself on the surface of Titan. And that takes, as I said, a couple hours. It's a lot less uh, nail biting than when we do a similar entry on Mars. <laughs> and again, that's because of that thick, dense atmosphere. It's just, it just, it's a lot slower and the parachute uh, you know, is able to slow you down a lot more. And then once we're there, our, our real mission begins, the surface mission, which will also be on the order of years. And here, you know, kind of think about the rotorcraft lander, It'll it's either flying or it's sitting on the surface, um, showing you these two different configurations. It spends most of its time on the surface. Um, really, the flight is, are these hops that it will do every couple of Titan days, remember Titan days are actually 16 Earth days, um, but it's gonna spend most of its time on the surface, um, either making measurements or um, you know, doing some housekeeping. Just some features I wanna call out about the lander. Uh, so it's power, it is designed to get its power from the um, MMRTG or multi-mission uh, radiothermal isotope generator, radiothermal thermal generator. And uh, that's the same power source that's used, for example, in Curiosity and Perseverance. So uh, designed to do that, that charges the battery that is used to power the lander. And it also provides heat that keeps the interior of the lander warm. Uh, communication, it uses direct to earth communication. There's no um, satellite around uh, Titan to communicate back to earth. And here you can see it's this high gain antenna that'll be used and it'll kind of be articulated around to get the best connection um, with earth when we need to talk to earth. And then, of course, for flight, it is a dual quadcopter. So you can see it has sort of four different locations for its rotors with, with two rotors each. And here's a picture of the mission principal investigator, uh, Zippy Turtle, holding um, one of the prototype rotors. And it gives you an idea of the scale of what these rotors look like. The landing site that we'll be going to um, is, is shown here. You can see it's right near the equator. And this is an area um, that combines both those dunes that we talked about, those equatorial sand dunes, which are expected, we think are full of organic sediments, as well as a big impact crater. And so this uh, impact crater that you can see in the image here is called Selk Crater. Um, it's about uh, I don't know, 80 kilometers in diameter across. And in this traverse here, uh, there are locations where we'll see areas with uh, this organic sand material, We'll see areas with exposed water ice crust in between those dunes. And then, of course, in the impact crater area, those are places where there was liquid water in the past. And liquid water and organics likely mixed together and some of that cool chemistry took place. And we're going to look for those areas and try to measure the types of compounds that may have been synthesized in that environment. Here's an image showing probably the best analog for the Titan sand dunes, um, the, the Namib Sand Sea here. So you have these really large dunes. They can be like two to four um, kilometers apart, uh, but then in between them, you get these interdune flat areas. And so again, on Titan, these are places where we expect to see exposed water ice in between those organic sands. The general exploration uh, strategy, we're gonna land um, in the dune fields. And then over the course of the mission, 
<coughs> excuse me, about 3.3 years, um, traverse and, and get to the crater. <coughs> excuse me. So right now this plan is about 74 T souls, which is what we call a Titan day. But remember that's 16 Earth days. So it ends up being over three years. Um, the traverse distance is um, nearly 200 kilometers is, is what's expected. And the idea is as we hop kind of from place to place along the way, we'll visit many, many different unique sites that represent these different areas of Titan surface composition. Um, and this little cartoon just shows <laughs> the idea of it flying kind of over these dune areas and then getting close to where the crater is. Um, I love talking about the general exploration strategy with Dragonfly because we we have those beautiful um, global images that we I've been showing you where you can see the different surface features, but we don't have like, well, there's no GPS, right? And we don't have really high resolution maps of the surface. So in a lot of ways, Dragonfly is gonna be making its own map as it goes. And it does this with this really cool strategy that we call the leapfrog strategy. So other than the very first time it lands where it, it just has to land itself, and this is done um, all autonomously with uh, special software that it uses um, to navigate itself and find safe landing sites. Then the Dragonfly uh, rotorcraft can then go kind of up in the air and, and look around and come back down. It can go up and maybe fly out over an area of interest and then come back and come back to its you know, first landing site. But then the science team and the team on the ground can evaluate that, that area that it flew over and we'll get all of this data back that shows sort of um, the, uh, elevations and images and pick the next landing location. Um, but, but to go to that next landing location, what'll happen is it'll go back up and then it'll fly over that landing location, keep scouting, getting more data, more images, then come back, land at that landing location. That's sort of that leapfrog concept. Um, and then while you're there on the surface there and doing great surface science, we're also able to evaluate that new area we scouted out and pick the next landing site. And so that's how we'll kind of build up these um, really great images and data of the Titan surface as we're flying along. And the plan right now, we're looking at trying to fly maybe about once every other T-Sol. So again, that's maybe once a month in Earth time. And again, most of the time is spent on the surface doing science. So what is that science? Uh, we have sort of a, a, a payload plan to do multidisciplinary science measurements that get at sort of these three major science themes. Um, looking for prebiotic chemistry, so trying to just see what are the chemical components um, on the Titan surface, the organic components, and are, are do they look anything like something that's interesting, you know, for biology on Earth? Um, understanding if this is a habitable environment, really, you know, from this, this um, you know, up close and personal view of the surface, uh, what do we learn about how the methane cycle operates, you know, just observing the atmosphere, the environment, you know, things like temperature, pressure, winds, uh, surface properties, and, and just really understanding how that, that environment, the whole environmental cycle works, you know, in, in each of the locations that we're in. And then also trying to understand if the organics and um, the past surface liquid uh, water reservoirs, or perhaps is trying to sense down and see if we can figure out how deep it is to the subsurface ocean, kind of really just understand the connection of all, all those things and processing and how that could have happened over time. And then finally, since we're measuring organic compounds and, and we're understanding the types of organic molecules that are there, especially ones that may have been exposed to water, it's also just this overall, um, you know, search for biosignatures. Um, and what that really means is just looking at all of the different molecules that we're able to measure and then trying to put them into the context of whether or not they indicate any kind of um, progression towards biochemistry or, or any kind of um, signatures that, that, you know, would be uh, for us thinking about earth life, you know, would be indicative of earth life or even, you know, perhaps not earth life, um, you know, looking for some, uh, what we would call an agnostic biosignature, something that could be in indicative of a complex uh, process that could be related to life, but maybe looks a little unfamiliar to us. So we do that, we have four instruments as well as a sampling system on our payload. So the DragMet is what we call the geophysics and meteorological package. So uh, that sort of thing that senses the environment and the surface properties. 
we have the mass spectrometer, dragonfly mass spectrometer, and that's what's going to measure uh, the the chemical composition, so the molecular composition of the samples that we take. And it's fed by a drill that is able to drill into that super cold surface um, and, and bring samples to the mass spectrometer uh, to measure. There's, of course, a full camera suite. I mean, we can't go to Titan and fly on Titan and not take lots of pictures and, and videos. Um, uh, so that we can see the environment. And of course, the imaging is so important also for us to understand the, the processing and the history of the types of components that uh, we see. Sorry, just doing a quick time check. Um, and then finally, we also have this gamma ray neutron spectrometer instrument. Um, and that's really cool because it's a, a instrument and I have an, an image that sort of senses the area that's around us and gives us our very first idea of what some of the elements are, uh, where we are and our, our first um, sort of reconnaissance of the area around us and whether or not we're on an, a spot that has a lot of water ice or has a lot of organics, for example. So this um, shows uh, a little video, hopefully it's, it's streaming well of the Draco drill, and it's actually this pneumatic transport system. So instead of drilling and picking up the sample and then moving it and trying to dump it into like a funnel or something, we actually have it's under constant flow and the sample gets sucked in through these pneumatic tubes, just like a vacuum cleaner kind of, um, and it gets captured in these cups and then the cups can be measured in the mass spectrometer to look at the sample inside of them. And that is um, really great because it's really, robust to a whole bunch of different types of samples because you know there's a lot of uncertainty about what we're going to find um, in the materials and we want to make sure that we have a drilling and a sampling system that can handle sort of the diversity of what we think we might find and this uh, video right now is showing an example of one of the measurements we can make which is to look for chirality of organic molecules um, and that is actually an important biosignature on earth and i think the next page has a graphic of this when i talk about the mass spectrometer. So the sampling system gives the samples to the mass spectrometer. The mass spectrometer is shown here in this, this orange area that's fed by all these tubes from the sampling system. Um, and it sits here in this spot of the dragonfly lander that we call the attic. And it gets fed the samples from the sampling system and then looks at the types of chemicals that are, that are comprised of them. And it does this using a couple different techniques to look at the chemicals that try to look at a, a wide range of molecules. And so this plot on the bottom left of the screen, it's a little bit busy, it's a little crazy looking, but um, to explain what it means, across the bottom axis, you just have molecular weight, which is the size of the molecules. And getting bigger and bigger molecules, um, usually you end up getting more complex uh, um, arrangements of the atoms in the molecules. And they're also often can be, um, harder to get into the gas phase for measurement or, or to heat up. And so along the left shows, well, how much energy does it take for us to get this molecule into our instrument to measure it? And there's these different techniques that we use to sort of probe ever and ever larger uh, molecules. And that includes a laser desorption technique where we shoot the sample with this laser and it gets the molecules into um, an ion that we can then put in an instrument and measure. And the, the point of this plot really just is to show that we can probe this whole big range of molecules that get ever and ever larger uh, using these different approaches that we have on the mass spectrometer. And one of the things that we have the capability to do is, for example, if we were to find some amino acids in some of the crater uh, materials that we explore, amino acids are um, uh, molecules um, among others, that have this property called um, chirality, which means that you can have the exact same atoms um, arranged and connected in the same way and yet not be exactly the same, not be uh, superimposable. And, and your hands, the cartoon always shows a hand because that's the best um, way to think about it. In your hand, right, your thumb is next to your first finger and then your middle finger and then your ring finger and then your pinky. And they're connected in the exact same way, but they're, you can't put them right on top of each other. They're not the same they're mirror images. And you get that with molecules too. And what's interesting about that is that if you were just to make a molecule like an amino acid in the lab, you'd get a roughly 50-50 mixture of these two things. But life on earth, including you and me, only uses one of the hands. 
right? So only, uh, for example, amino acids that are used in our proteins are only left-handed. And so that's considered a potential biosignature. And so we, if we find amino acids on Titan, for example, we could measure that handedness and try to understand if there's a big imbalance, which could be indicative of some kind of really interesting driving process um, that could be related to, to a biochemistry. Uh, this cartoon shows uh, how that one instrument tells us just what are we sitting on. It classifies material. Every time we land, we want to know are we on a new area? Um, is this a type of material that we've seen before or not seen before? Um, and it does it by, by um, pulsing out these neutrons and then measuring back some neutrons and gamma rays that come back um, and give an idea of what are the elements that are in the surface. So again, I think I mentioned it would give us our first idea. Are we just sitting on a big block of ice, of water ice? Or are we sitting on a bunch of organic material with lots of carbon? Or maybe both. If there's some layering, we would be able to sense that uh, potentially with this, this technique. And that is sort of our first step in understanding, is this a place where we want to drill and take one of those samples for the mass spectrometer or not? Um, we also have, uh, again, to understand the environment, uh, meteorological, and seismological monitoring. And so we've got the atmospheric area that we're gonna be probing, even looking at things like methane humidity uh, to understand the methane cycle, um, temperature and pressure, wind speed, direction, um, things like that, atmospheric profiles. Then we have measurements to understand surface properties such as porosity and maybe even like if it's damp, if damp with methane maybe, um, kind of think of like wet, wet dirt on earth. Um, and then also to understand, as I mentioned, some of the structure below the surface that we're looking at. Um, and that includes um, monitoring the seismic activity. So if there are some quakes on Titan, uh, we might be able to sense them. And then that could help us constrain maybe how deep is it to that subsurface ocean. And finally, the imaging, of course, is, is, is not just good for sharing with the public and getting everyone excited, but there's also, um, you know, a lot of science gets done with the imaging, ranging from the types of panoramas that you take to understand the context of where you are, and then kind of drilling down deeper and deeper to understanding the type of material that you're sitting on, and, and how did it get there, and what processes led to it getting there. Um, and so we'll be doing that with sort of this whole camera suite that, that looks at these different ranges. And that even includes uh, looking at surface materials illuminated in different colors of LEDs. And that's sort of a, a way that we're trying to understand the composition and how the surface absorbs or reflects certain different colors. And we can, we're also gonna carry UV with that. And this is a cool image showing how certain organic molecules that we think might be on the Titan surface glow, they, they fluoresce with UV. And so we should be able to see that. And the, and maybe if we can see in some different patchy locations on the ground, it tells us, you know, what kind of materials there even before we've started drilling. So we're um, coming up actually on our two year anniversary of when we were selected by NASA, but we've been spending a lot of time in some of these really critical early phases where you do a lot of testing with prototypes and a lot of, you know, we think of a risk reduction so that when it gets time to actually build the full on Dragonfly lander, you know, we know everything is working exactly how we want and, and we know everything is, um, uh, you know, ready to go. And so some of the early testing that we've done has been has been really fun. Uh, the image on the bottom left shows uh, the team who's building the sampling system doing uh, a bunch of testing inside this big chamber that's actually operates at Titan conditions, which is not easy to do because I talked about how it's high pressure and very, very cold. Uh, so it's this big, big bulky chamber uh, you can see and they were able to run that, that sucking up sampling system inside that chamber. Uh, in the center, you see some images from some of the drone. We have uh, drone platforms that are used to test various aspects of the automation of the flight and the software and some of the components. And so a lot of testing is going on with that. And then on the right, you see images of doing um, wind tunnel testing. And that, uh, again, helps sort of validate some of our flight models in things like the rotor design or, or how much power is needed, for example. So it's kind of like a really fun tinkering phase almost of, uh, of the mission as, as we start to build up all, all the components. Uh, so with that, I'll just end with kind of the this overall image, you know, giving you an idea of what it will be like for Dragonfly on Titan. Um, you know, this is really like the first chance to be up close on the surface 
um, of an ocean world, you know, measuring the surface composition, understanding uh, what kind of chemistry has taken place and, and, and really getting to know this environment in a place that we know has all the key ingredients of life. And, and the question is, how do, how do they come together and, and what can we learn from it? Um, so with that, I was going to end on this slide. Um, there's a couple fun movies um, that you can go to, uh, the one I was showing with the sampling, for example, and there's some more that show the sampling system as well as the Dragonfly website, uh, which has lots of great images and, and movies and some links to some other presentations about Dragonfly. And so with that, I'm done. Thank you so much uh, for coming tonight and for your attention. Awesome. Give it up for Dr. Melissa Trainer. You did a fantastic job. A lot of people are saying thank you. And I just want to um, be to bring up Elizabeth. Elizabeth said, you know, thank you. You did an excellent job with using similes connect with Titan um, via our experience of Earth's processes. And I agree. Thank you so much for that connection for us. You did make it easier for us to understand. So let's go ahead and start with Q&A. And I want to thank everyone for all the wonderful questions. And so we're going to go ahead and start. I'm going to actually start with um, another comment made by Miss Elizabeth. It said, in the um, panorama picture or printed panoramic picture, does two meters mean, excuse me, two M mean two meters or two miles? Oh, oh, let me go back to that slide to make sure. Oh, this one? Yeah, that means two meters. And these okay. are, images, I should say, these are images taken um, at Mars with uh, similar camera systems on um, the Mars rover. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for clarification. And again, thank you, Elizabeth, for the question. Um, a question from Larry says, what would the dragonfly use as an energy source? Oh, that's a good question. So I mentioned that um, the power source that we're designed to use is the same type of, it's it's like a nuclear power source that they use on curiosity and perseverance. So basically it's um, a device that turns nuclear decay of plutonium into a current that charges a battery. And then you use the battery as actually what you run off of because it has stored up energy and then you drain the battery down and then you sit for a while and it slowly gets charged up again with that power source. So we're designed that's what we're designed to use. And at some point, you know, NASA will make the final decision if, if that's what, if that's what we get. <laughs> okay. And a question that comes from Carr that states, how do you, how do methane proof dragonflies housing in the event of rain or snow? Yeah. Oh, good question. Um, so methane itself is not toxic right? It's not corrosive. It, it's not really that problematic for most of the materials. The one concern would be any kind of lubrication. Um, if you use a lubrication that could be dissolved in liquid methane, right? You wouldn't want, just like on earth, you wouldn't want rain to get rid of all the oil in your car, right? So we just had to pay close attention to make sure there's no areas where rain could get in um, and or cause pro that or interact with any materials, you know, pay close attention to the types of lubricants that we used on any exposed areas. Um, and then there has definitely been, especially as I said, in you know, kind of this earlier phases, um, testing where we've uh, looked at some of those potential sensitivities, but overall met it's, you know, methane, liquid methane actually is not, it's not that big a problem. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Grace. Yeah, well, I wanted to jump up higher in the Q&A. We had two people ask a question about the previous mission to Titan, and they wanted to know why did the Huygens probe only survive for about 70 minutes? Was that expected? And how do we ensure that Dragonfly is going to have a long lifespan? All right, those are fabulous questions. Thank you. Um, it was totally, actually, it, it was expected, but almost not necessarily expected that it even lived for 70 minutes on the surface. I should say the main, the prime mission of Huygens was actually the descent. So it did all its measurements as it fell through the atmosphere for about two hours um, and took measurements of the atmospheric composition as it went down, and temperature and pressure profiles. And part of why we know so much about um, and that we're confident about how it, we will be able to fly safely on Titan with Dragonfly comes from 
the type, those measurements and, and the models that could be built from them. And at the time, it, it was unclear what the surface of Titan would be like. And so there were um, some schools of thought that there could be enough ethane condensing out and making a big giant ethane ocean. And what if it splashes down this giant ocean? And, um, or, you know, we didn't know quite what it would land in. So it was designed just to make it to the, the bottom and anything after that was bonus. And so the fact that it survived and it kept taking measurements and it took some really cool measurements from the surface actually that it could transmit back was, was really great. And I should say it was operated off of, of just a battery, nothing else to recharge the battery. So once the battery drained, it, it was done. And now it's kind of frozen, sad, left on the surface of Titan. <laughs> um, but Dragonfly, of course, is, is designed to be a long lived mission. So, you know, at every stage, we're paying close attention. You know, it has a, a power source that can go for years and years and years. Um, as we know, it's being designed to keep itself warm with that power source for years and years and years. And everything that we do, everything that we test will have that lifetime in mind. Fantastic. Well, if, if you don't mind, I'll ask a couple more questions about the atmosphere. There were a lot of those that came up. Um, so Carl asked, how well analyzed are these atmospheric aerosols? And are there any concerns about, and this is maybe a little related to what we already talked about, but are there any concerns about corrosive elements or sticky particles that could clog up or damage the dragonfly? This is such a great question. Thank you. <laughs> um, the organic aerosols themselves um, that are at Titan are only, they're not as characterized as I wish they were because that's the kind of research I, I've been doing for years and years and years. So scientists have spent decades and decades, even, you know, including Carl Sagan worked on this, simulating the process of formation in labs, trying to understand what we think the material on Titan is. What do we think these organics are that make up these particles? Um, and we have measurements of sort of the very baby, baby particles from the very top of the atmosphere. So as Cassini flew by and it skimmed the atmosphere, it was able to make some measurements that shows, that's how we know we have these really big molecules um, they're forming. Some of them look like they might be these aromatic molecules, basically these ring searches almost like honeycomb or chicken wire. Um, and some of them uh, we know have um, like nitrogen groups on them. Uh, we can see, we, it's easier to see the composition of the gas phase molecules from in the atmosphere through spectroscopy, through observing with telescopes or, or things like that. Um, than the solid, but from what we can tell of the solid material, we know that it has certain types of organics in it, uh, but we don't know exactly what they are. So that's one thing, you know, I, I'm just so excited to find out when we get there, at least from some of the surface materials we can measure, like those dunes, what will that tell us about the atmospheric uh, stuff? There was an experiment on Huygens that um, tried to capture some of the aerosol and, and measure it, but it, it just had a couple components come out. It wasn't um, we think it may have missed some things. It wasn't uh, completely definitive. Um, in terms of toxic components, I would say we're more worried about sticky than we are necessarily about corrosive, just based on what we know that these molecules are, are mostly made of hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and what we think they are. Um, and so that's part of why we designed the sampling system the way we did, is that, um, like, instead of, like I said, instead of scooping something and then, and then hoping it comes off your scoop, right? <laughs> and, and not getting stuck to it. <laughs> um, you know, the idea of the sort of the drilling and then sucking in the particles, it keeps those particles constantly in motion in this cold airflow. So it keeps them from warming up while you're collecting them in a way that would make them sticky, secure, right? Um, and it also keeps them in constant motion and not really touching any of the surfaces while they're flowing through at high, you know, kind of in a high airflow. And, and so that a lot of the time that we spent designing that sampling system was, was, making sure that we don't have to worry, you know, as much, but, you know, we'll still have to be very careful when we go to take a sample. We'll want to make sure we don't think it's something that's too, too sticky. Yeah, that will be, I mean, I hope it's not real sticky. That could be a problem. Yeah. Um, so also in uh, following on with the atmosphere questions, we have a question from Jim about, um, about imaging and the photos that you'll take on Titan. Um, but with all this talk of the very thick atmosphere, what are the levels of illumination that you expect to have? Yeah, so the levels of illumination, oh, I have another talk where, I, where we talked about this, so, so I wish I'd shown it. Um, another slide that sometimes I talk to. Um, it's it's a little bit like, like kind of like twilight. Um, and 
so you definitely have to be able to, you know, uh, make sure that your cameras are very sensitive, right? To get enough light in to be able to, to see things. Um, but even though we talk about how hazy it is, and you see those pictures where it just looks like totally orange from up above, it's not so hazy. It's not like being in a fog, right? Um, because when you see it from up above, what you're looking through is actually about a thousand kilometers of atmosphere. So you kind of see all the particles in that column between you and you trying to see the surface. So it just looks like it's just totally full of particles. But when you're on the surface, it's not so dense. You know, you can see through it and you can see, you know, we expect to be able to see, I think, on the order of, you know, like kilometers. Um, and does, so. it does the, do you expect that the atmosphere is going to interfere with communications? No, no. So okay. the right, the, the communication um, plan with that antenna that I showed is, is designed to work from the surface of Titan, right, to take advantage of, of you know, um, the windows. I mean, the biggest problem is just how far away the Earth is, uh, not the atmosphere of Titan. OK, well, that was another question um, okay. that we had from Elizabeth, which was how long does it take to transmit data from Earth to Titan? Or yeah, so the time is, is something it's like 80 minutes, but that's that's like one way. And that is, um, you know, a, a data packet that you send. Um, but in reality, it takes a really long time to send like all the data you might collect when you're doing an investigation. It'll actually take a long time to send all of it back. So every time you have a connection where you're talking to the Earth, you're kind of sending it back bit by bit, bit by bit. Um, and and that's one thing when the further out we get in the solar system, the more and more that is a challenge. Um, you know, we just saw these most amazing videos of Perseverance landing on the surface of Mars. And you could see them like, you know, we had them so soon after and we can watch this whole video. Right. That's not unfortunately. <laughs> We're not going to get that much data back that fast from Titan. It just, you know, it just, we can't. We're kind of, a, you know, there's a limit to how much um, you can get back when you're you're that far away. Because remember, Mars also has, you know, satellites that serve as calm satellites for any of the surface things. So it's a, it's a little different paradigm. So those of us who work on the Mars mission, you know, we have to kind of reset our thinking about like, oh, it's going to take a lot longer to get some of this data back. Um, you know, and how's that going to work? Because we still have to turn around decisions and decide what to do next. I've got one other question about the communications. So Scott asks, um, does the Dragonfly's antenna have to be pointed at Earth in order to communicate? And if so, does that mean that the comms are limited to, yes. you know, a, a, a limited number of days? Yes, that's a yes. Um, the answer is yes, it does. <laughs> it has to be pointed to Earth, which means that um, if it's nighttime where we are, we're because we're not facing the sun, we're not facing Earth, right? So that so that whole nighttime period of eight eight Earth days is is quiet. It's a quiet period where we can't talk to the lander. Okay, well, I'm just gonna double dutch and get in here. I want to give you a question from our fearless director, Dr. Lisa Gaddis, and she asked, "Did anything in the ingenuity testing on Mars with Perseverance surprise you about extraterrestrial flight?" Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I think we're just all so thrilled about how well it went, right? About how fantastic it's been going because um, that's the first time that we're doing that that kind of flight on another planet. And as I've mentioned in in some ways, right, flight on Titan is a lot easier in terms of like getting the lift and getting the power um, uh, than Mars. But of course it has different challenges as I also talked about being very far away <laughs> and being very, very cold. Um, um, but there's definitely, you know, a lot that can, I think, um, probably uh, be learned and shared shared between the teams, you know, as Ingenuity continues its its investigation. Um, so I wouldn't say I was surprised it was successful because I, I, you know, I know that uh, the whole team, the engineers worked worked really hard on it, um, but just so happy, <laughs> just so pleased. Awesome. Well, I'm going to also bring up a question from a YouTuber. They asked, will Dragonfly have a microscope on board? And if the answer is no, why not? So what we do have, actually, I think I still have the um, slide up, <laughs> um, is this uh, microscopic imager. 
So it's not quite the same as you might be thinking of like a microscope or you would look at, you know, little teeny, teeny, tiny things. Um, but we use this microscopic imager, as you can see here, to get to get kind of a close up view of the, of the different um, grains or the surface materials that we're um, looking at uh, with Titan. And so that's kind of really give us some of that that close up scale to get information about where did those materials come from, especially if we see something that's sort of pebbly or grainy in the dune sands, you know, we're really interested in understanding how those dunes form and, and by looking at their shapes and how they're stuck together um, and, and, and kind of maybe even, um, you know, how they've moved, uh, then we're going to learn a lot about that. All right, awesome. And so we're going to start rounding down the questions, but I definitely want to make sure I get this one because it was at the earlier, at the beginning of your talk. And so Elizabeth asks, do you think that the crater impact happened after the dunes were created in the bottom left? And so I'm thinking she was just referencing um, an earlier image during your presentation. Do you remember which one that could be? Oh, yeah, yes. No, that is a great question. Well, what's really cool about the dunes is you can actually see them go around a lot of when you get close up a lot of the surface features. So when you see them kind of migrating around, um, you know, you can tell that the dunes are formed after after that feature. Um, it's certainly possible that maybe there were some dunes when that crater impact happened, but the dunes keep going. Right. So they're kind of like, the idea is they're constantly migrating slowly, but but constantly migrating. So I, I think it's a very interesting question to ask if the dunes were there when that impact happened. Um, yeah, and then Lisa mentioned that those dunes were huge, <laughs> she said. Yeah. Um, for our planetary studies, can we use the terms North Pole, Equator, South Pole, like that of Earth, or is there another way to represent this like reference line or so? So I certainly do. Um, when we talk about Mars and we talk about Titan, we definitely talk about, um, you know, North Pole, South Pole. Um, it's defined by how the body rotates, right? How it spins around on its axis. And, and, then, and then I guess we North is based on Earth North. So, <laughs> um, you know, kind of the, the the plane on which all of the planets, most of them, um, uh, orbit the sun on, and then and then we've kind of arbitrarily, which one you call north and south, you know, uh, set. But the equator certainly is is um, you know a concept that can that translates across the different planets. So we use those terms, yes. <laughs> well, awesome. And so, Grace, do you have a? question that you definitely want to ask before we wrap things up. I think we're going to give a few more questions and then we are going to bid it good night because we want to make sure that we are honoring everybody's time. So Grace, go ahead and ask the questions and then I have a few more questions and then we'll wrap up. Go ahead, Grace. Perfect. So I did just have a couple um, kind of under the theme of geology. We had, um, we had a question from Shabana that was curious about the underlying geology of Titan. Like, do we know if it's Oleitic basaltic, like on Mars? Do we know about that interior silicate portion? Um, and then I did also see two part question, right? You have your, your drag net instrument. Um, so do we know or do we expect if Titan is, uh, is geologically active or not? Okay, so those are great questions. I'm gonna my usual caveat, which is I'm a chemist. And so I do my best <laughs> to answer geology questions. <laughs> um, because planetary science is so multidisciplinary, so we all kind of have to learn a little of everything. Um, we don't know, I mean, what we think we know about that core, that hydrosilicate core just comes from thinking about what, what materials were around at the time that Titan formed and what is it likely that probably it's made out of. But I mean, we don't, we don't know for sure what it is, right? Um, but in terms of, I think the other questions about like, what is the, uh, geology, like maybe at the surface in terms of whether, you know, it's uh, so, so what I was saying is it's, it's like, it's, it's, it's not rock the way we think of earth, right. Or Mars, for example, you know, it's, it's ice. So the, the crust of Titan is, is water ice and, and maybe there's ammonia in there and, and there might be some other things in there. You know, one question we have is if there's salts in that interior ocean, do you see any evidence of them on, on the surface if some ocean materials have made to the surface or if impactors have brought them in? You know, we, we don't know. We're interested in looking for evidence of potentially some uh, salt materials, you know, even, 
you know, sodium chloride, for example. Um, and, and then the organics that fall on the surface almost kind of act like, um, like a soil or a dust or, or, or something on top of that water ice. And so what we think, um, you know, what we're thinking of is that we're sort of going to be categorizing this new meteor, you know, mineralogy as we're exploring the surface of Titan and, and, and coming up with these, these new types of materials and, and figuring out how they operate on Titan and, and they'll sort of be Titan minerals but there'll be more organics and water and things like that um, at very cold temperatures. So, so that's gonna be really exciting. Um, and then in terms of, is it geologically active? Um, it's certainly expected, there's definitely like tidal forces that act on it, um, you know, a little tugging and, and pulling, you know, as it, as it orbits around Saturn. So we had some of those tectonic features. And, and then one question is there cryovolcanism or are there quakes, are there Titan quakes? And so um, we do have the ability to, to, when we're sitting on the surface, listen for seismic activity. Um, you know, we, we can't promise Titan will give it to us, you know, but we're, we want to be ready <laughs> in case it is. Wow, fantastic. So I have a few questions for our audience. So audience, I'm going to start launching a poll question for you. And um, I'm going to give you just a few seconds to answer it, please. Um, so the question is, uh, how has tonight's program affected your awareness of planetary science and um, exploration? Go ahead and answer those poll questions. And basically, this is just gathers data for future programs. All right, in five, four, three, two. Thank you all so much for voting. And then I have a second question. Last and final. And this one is instead of awareness, this is says interest. So how has tonight's program affected your interest in planetary science and exploration? Awesome, five, four, three, two, one. Again, thank you so much for voting. Um, well, Dr. Trainer, I cannot say it enough. Thank you so very much for your presentation. You did a fantastic job. For those of you of questions that were not answered, I did a, do a screenshot of those. So I definitely will be sending those over to Dr. Trainer and have you to answer them in, in your time and send them back um, out uh, to those individuals as they answered them. So thank you again so very much for being here and giving us your best presentation ever. I thank you everyone, YouTube, for joining us tonight as well. Um, for a future program, you can always visit our uh, webpage, the Lunar and Planetary Institute to see what other virtual programs we have in this series. We do not have a committed speaker for the next one, but guess what? You can be the first one to know if you sign up with our news page, newsletter. Um, again, my name is Sherelle Webb. Thank you so much, Grace, Yolanda, Andy, for your participation tonight, and Dr. Lisa Gaddis for being here and submitting awesome questions. And most of all, thank you all for joining us tonight. You guys have a fantastic evening, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everyone.